Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us at SoCal Hymns Virtual Women in Health IT event, um, theme of survival mode. My name is Bella Zaghi and I'm past president and I founded the local chapters Women in Health IT division. The current SoCal Hymns president, Jerry Pavia, could not make it tonight to address us all in person. However, she shared her thoughts with me and asked me to share them with you this evening. She regrets that she cannot make it, but she wants to thank everyone, all of you for joining us tonight with Healthcare IT's virtual panel about standing colleagues rallying together to bring the heart of women and moderated by me. The Southern California chapter and board would like to thank all of you, all hundred of uh, people registered, men and women for joining us. And thank you to our generous sponsor in Pravada who is sponsoring care packages that will be sent out to our members um, starting tomorrow. We have a few announcements. The New England, Alabama, Mississippi, and Southern California chapters of HIMSS will be hosting a joint interactive virtual event on November 12th with networking opportunities, breakout sessions, keynotes, exhibit hall, challenges and games, and subject matter experts covering several topics on emergency preparedness and healthcare. The best, best part is you can join without even leaving your home. You can register on SoCal Hymns website. The winter and spring months of 2021 will feature collaborative e-series conferences with Southern California and Northern, Northern California chapters, a health information technology summit in the spring, an innovation summit along with advocacy and state of health IT day at the Capitol in conjunction with Northern California chapter. Um, if you are not on mute already, please go on mute. Thank you. Um, the Southern California Women in Health IT Division kicked off in fall 2018 with a wonderful evening of networking and learning from local health executives. Um, I was planning to have the second event in the spring of 2020, but we all know what happened. I had to push the event back because of the safer at home mandates to FY 2021. When summer was almost done, I realized that there is no end date for this pandemic. And at the same time, I found that there's a great need to share content and have an event due to all the changes going on in the world. And especially for women who work in health IT. Not only were things changing at work due to changes in the health focus, but they were taking on, but women were taking on different roles in addition to contributing to the, to the industry. In, in, in addition, I found that there are many potential changes coming through the upcoming elections and the political atmosphere. Every human being in the world, no matter age, race, or gender, has been affected by the times to some extent. From children who must do school at home, to young adults who had plans to go to college or start their first summer job, to the working women, to the grandparents. It has come to the point where even saying 2020 to anyone has become an icebreaker because we, we have come to a point of a mutual experience. Moreover, the data is showing that we still have work to bring women to the forefront in the industry. The most recent um, 2020 Women in Health IT EMEA annual survey showed that there has been a gradual rise in women's participation in the digital health workforce. Nonetheless, women are still underrepresented in health information and technology and tend to be recognized less for their contributions. For instance, there was a question about whether the industry has enough, enough value recognition for women executives. And in 2019, 19% answered yes. In 2020, we had a slight increase and 39% yes, answered yes. However, we have some way to go. I brainstormed um, early in the fall and reached out to Judy Murphy, who has been a personal um, mentor for me and someone that I looked up to in the industry. She connected me with Gita and Ligia. These three speakers are powerful in their own right and be, can be considered a keynote, keynote speaker at any event for their accomplishments. And in fact, each one has been recognized as HIMSS most influential woman in health IT in one of the years, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Judy in 2018, Ligia in 2019, and Gita in 2020. The first panelist, Judy Murphy, is from Minnesota. She's a nurse executive and health IT leader with a long history in health and nursing informatics. She was the chief nursing officer at IBM Global Health, where she built relationships and expanded business across the healthcare industry. 
Prior to work working in IBM, she was CNO and Deputy National Coordinator for Programs and Policy at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, ONC in Washington, DC. In these roles, she led federal efforts to assist healthcare providers in adopting health IT. Judy came to ONC with over two decades of health informatics experience at Aurora Health, where she led their application in EHR program since 1995, when Aurora was an early adopter of health IT. She's published numerous articles and book chapters and has done hundreds of presentations nationally and internationally. She has served on numerous boards and won many um, awards. We are so fortunate to have her here with us tonight. The second panelist is Ligia Ricciardi from Washington, DC. She has been a vanguard of the digital patient engagement movement for over a decade. She has helped to grow several entrepreneurial ventures, including Carium, a platform to connect patients and providers virtually, which she supports in the areas of patient engagement and thought leadership. Previously, she set up and led national programs and policy development related to consumers and digital health through the US Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, the ONC, and the Federal Communications Commission, FCC. Ligia was recently um, awarded several awards, um, including the one, Most Influential Woman in Health IT with HIMSS and also uh, Most Powerful Woman in Health IT at, by Health Data. Um, she is a HIMSS digital influencer, a frequent blogger, and she has been featured on C-SPAN, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, and Consumer Reports. Our third panelist comes to us from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Dr. Gita Nayar. She's a nationally recognized leader in healthcare information technology, a physician executive, a frequently sought after speaker and an author with unique perspectives that bridge clinical, medicine, business, communications, and digital health. Dr. Nayar currently serves as executive medical director for Salesforce, connecting North American enterprise health systems to te technologies that empower hospitals, enhance the work of physicians, and improve patient care. Previously, she served as the Chief Medical Officer for Greenway Health. She has also held the role of Chief, Chief Healthcare and Innovation Officer for Femwell Group Health. And prior to this, she was the Chief Medical Information Officer at AT&T, where she provided subject matter expertise, thought leadership, and strategic direction for the multinational company's health division. She has held several positions in media with professional societies, including as the host of Top Line MD TV, a digital medical news channel catering in South Florida consumers. She is a specialist in neurotology, maintains active practice and faculty affiliation with the University of Miami. As you can see, all our speakers come from different backgrounds. Uh, we have a nurse, we have a physician, and we also have a transformational leader. And they're all in different places in, in their life. And I'm very excited to hear their perspective tonight. But before we begin, I would like to go over some logistics. Um, again, everybody will be on mute and I will be asking our panelists individual questions and questions addressed to the group for the first 45 minutes. Then I will open the panel to questions from the audience, which you may send to me through the chat box. At the conclusion of the event, you have the option to stay on and be put into a breakout room of four to five people for 15 minutes of networking. If you would like to post anything about this event on social media, please use the hashtag SoCalHIMS or hashtag Women in Health IT. So without further ado, I would like to begin with the first question. My question goes to all panelists. Tell us about your background, where are you from, and a little bit about the work you do. And possibly if it's changed pre-COVID and after COVID, if you can also go into that as well. So can we start with Judy? Oh, she's on mute. Let me unmute her. Oh, I need to ask her. To <laughs> you. There we go. Somebody's sending me a message going, your lips are moving and we can't hear you. Um, I was saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a great introduction for all, for all of us. Great topic, interesting times, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to share some thoughts on those those interesting times. As far as my background, I, I one of the things I find most interesting about my own career trajectory was, you know, working in a provider organization initially and thinking that was really going to be my my whole life, um, and you know, was a nurse. 
uh, a staff nurse and an assistant head nurse and a head nurse kind of doing the traditional thing, um, but then got real interested in IT when I moved into in-service education. Um, and for those of you who are younger, that was in the 80s. And so it was a, a different world back then. But what was interesting about it is you could see the potential. You could see how that was gonna change um, the way we thought about what we were doing uh, in clinical practice. And so I, I um, did some things through in-service education, but eventually um, got myself a job in the IT department um, itself and worked there for more than 25 years. Um, starting in the department when there were like 27 people and when I left there were 750. And that again is just the growth, um, not just of the organization, but the growth of, of technology and healthcare. Um, and so I was settled into that and, and kind of thought that was going to be my, my life's job. Um, but toward the end of my career got engaged at the national level. And I had been involved in organizational work at at HIMSS and at the American Medical Informatics Association. So kind of had a, a, a bigger view than just my own little, you know, um, Wisconsin view of Aurora Healthcare. And what was interesting is, you know, it was getting pretty, um, I'll say political, uh, not anything like the politics we have today, but political in that um, both uh, President Bush and President Obama made comments about supporting the rollout, if you will, of electronic health records. And, you know, that was just an unbelievable time um, in about 20, 20, 2009 to, to 2010. And so got uh, assigned, if you will, or appointed to a position on the Health IT um, Standards Committee and started getting this nice, you know, broad view. And anyway, got really interested in the government at that point. And so when there was an opportunity to move into the government itself, I, I went in whole hog, you know, I, I moved my, my family, I, I built, um, sold my house, got a new house, all that kind of stuff, um, and worked for the government for only three and a half years because it ended up being well, harder, maybe I'll say in some ways than, than I thought it was gonna be. But it was also that um, the, the interest and the money supporting the programs and things that we were working on was starting to dwindle. And so then I thought, well, I'm gonna go back, maybe go back into practice, um, you know, go back into a provider organization, but um, decided that if things were going to change, it was probably going to be our vendor world um, that was going to change it and uh, was had the opportunity to work for IBM um, and spent five years at IBM. And many of you probably know, maybe you don't, um, I did retire just in July of this year. And so now I'm everything I'm doing is stuff I want to do, like this panel. Um, I don't have to worry about weekly pressures or daily pressures of, of working at a large company. Um, and I can just do what I'll call the, the fun stuff. So that's my life and we'll turn it over. Who do you want to go to second? Um, we can go to Lake Gia. Great. All right, sounds good. So my background is maybe a little bit different. I think we each of us has a unique background, but um, one of the ways in, in which it's different is that I, um, back when I was an undergrad, I was a liberal arts major. So I studied history and Italian and I'm like an artist at my core and I never would have guessed that I would have ended up working in health IT ever. Um, so I'm kind of a generalist and I like looking at big patterns and trends and when I graduated from college, I didn't know honestly like what I would want to do, but I was really interested in and I got a position at Harvard Business School writing case studies with a business historian. So I was working with him and looking at kind of the big picture of American business history and what were the big forces. And we did a bunch of work that was related to technology and I was like, wow, that is so clearly the thing that is really reshaping the whole landscape right now. So that's when I first got really excited about information technology generally. And um, I actually did some case studies on things like the Federal Communications Commission. And this was like mid to late 90s and thinking about should the government regulate the internet? Why, why not? What can it do? So I ended up going to the FCC um, and doing a variety of jobs there. I started out speech writing for the chairman. So I've always had this kind of like communication side and then got really into policy and I was, most interested in healthcare and in education related to technology. Cause I thought these are areas where technology fundamentally changes the balance of power in an area um, in particular in healthcare by empowering potentially people, patients to get information when and where they need it. 
And of course, over time, my thinking on that has evolved. That wasn't all immediately clear to me at the beginning, but it was appealing. And since then, I've worked in the public sector, in the private sector, a couple times in the federal government, including at the ONC with, with um, Judy, which was awesome. And um, I've also had a couple of startup experiences, including working at Carium. And um, I like growing and making things. So whether that's like a program or a business, that's just super appealing to me. Great, thank you. And Gita? Sure. Well, well, first of all, I just want to say that Lygia and Judy are, are some of my um, sisters from another mister. So I, I admire them both and really appreciate the opportunity uh, this evening to speak with all of you. Um, you know, I, I have to tell you that I come from a medical family. My mom is a doc. My dad is a doc. My brother is a doc. We're a very boring South Asian family. Um, and when I still explain to them what I do. I, I'm sort of the black sheep of the family. And I remember when I took my role at at and that my dad just called me and was like, I don't understand. We spent all this money in medical school and now you work for the phone company? This just feels like a waste. It feels like a waste. So I share all of that to say exactly what Lydia uh, said and Judy said in, in her own way, which is that you know, life is a series of happenstances and accidents. And I, I very much went into healthcare and medicine because I am a passionate doc at heart. I'm still practicing um, very much and plan to retire uh, just like Judy and actually just see patients for free for coconuts, right? So what everything I do in health tech is very much motivated by the clinical angle. And unfortunately health technology, like so many broken parts of our system this is my daughter, everyone. So this is part of being a woman in health IT at like 8.30 on the West Coast. Hi, Ronnie. You wanna say hi? Everyone? Yes, they can see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, bye, Ronnie. Bye, Love you. Have a great time. Thank you for the chocolate. Okay, bye, love you. All right, guys. Um, it's a lot bye. to juggle, which, which we'll talk about later. Um, but I, I think all of that to say there are so many broken parts of our system, right? And as a physician whose primary goal remains to take care of patients, I really felt this responsibility to say, you know, gosh, from someone who touches patients, let me explain why the payer system is, is incorrect. Let me explain why there's burnout as it relates to tech. And, you know, I found myself in tech um, because I was the generation of physicians who went from paper to digital while in their residency and trying to learn how to be a doc. So that was fun as well as training in South Florida and learning Spanish at the same time. So it was, it was a lot. And, and I just say that, you know, for who, wherever you are on the spectrum of your career, different things will come to you, which might be challenges and they turn into opportunities as cheesy as that might sound. But, but this was all very accidental. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be working for a company like Salesforce at this very historic time and to have a CEO out there that's talking about wearing a mask and donating PPE and doing everything as, as a business can in this uh, historic crisis for the, for the globe. So jazz to be here tonight and, and thank you for, uh, for saying hi to my daughter. <laughs> Great, thank you, Gita. Um, so the next question is for all the panelists. Um, each of you work in different arenas um, and how does the industry landscape look right now? How has it changed since March when the pandemic and the safer at home minutes began, like whether it's the academic setting or um, vendor setting, like how does it look like right now? And how did how did it change from what it was before? So um, why don't we try to start with Ligia? Sure, so um, Carium is a company that is relatively young. It's a couple of years old and it is focused on um, a broad transformation play. In other words, really moving toward enabling a new um, system of healthcare that's much more patient centric. And in the immediate time of the pandemic, we of course realized that people just needed to get, they just needed to survive it. And so I should say our customers are primarily health systems and particularly those in primary care, smaller systems, as well as larger ones. And although they were moving to telehealth and they had a hunger to suddenly do everything you know, virtually, which is terrific, on the other hand, they were less willing and able to put the cycles into the longer transformation play. So what that's meant for us is more of a focus on how can we help them in the immediate term with things like remote patient monitoring, which is something that they can get federal dollars for in the short term. So I would say, um, 
I mean, everyone's aware of the general move toward virtual and digital care. And I think that that hopefully will continue way past, well, whenever the pandemic ends. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's also sort of slowed down in some ways the general progression of transformation in other ways as people have had to just like stop everything and deal with COVID. Um, in the long term, I'm hoping to get back to more of a push toward value-based care, which I think will be better for not only our customers, but us as a business and for patients. Um, but in the short term, it's really been about like all hands on deck. How do we help providers both provide care safely at a distance and get some money in for doing that? Yeah. Um, Gita, how about you? You're in arena. How does it look like now versus before COVID? Sure. So, so great question. Like everyone else, everything has been flipped on its head, right? I, I think as an industry, what's happened and, and a big part of why I joined Salesforce is because digital transformation, digital engagement, virtual care just got accelerated like this, right? Judy knows this, like Gia knows this. Everyone thought they would do telemedicine. Everyone thought, yeah, texting your doc was a great idea and, and doing consumer activation, just like retail and hospitality was always a good idea. But it was kind of like five years down the roadmap, maybe 10. And overnight, what has happened is that every hospital C-suite executive has had to say, oh my God, how are we meeting the patient in the home? And how are we attracting patients who don't want to come to the ER? And how are we making consumers smart on their healthcare? And how are we not getting our lunch eaten now by CVS and Walmart that are a lot easier to deal with than your average hospital system? Um, I think what we're also seeing is that the EHR is not the end all be all, right? The EHR, um, there is no good EHR. I will, I will be happy to say this probably for every doc and having come from an EHR company. There's no EHR that is loved by any physician uh, in the United States of America, right? All of them have major flaws. All of them have workarounds, which are the standard of care and that in itself speaks volumes about that product, right? So when we think about digital transformation, that said the EHR is not going away, nor, nor should it. It's just that it needs to get better and be more intuitive for the clinical end user, the physician, the nurse, the care team. But the opportunity we have now with this sort of acceleration into digital transformation is to think about complementary technologies, right? How do you do patient engagement and complement patient engagement tools, CRM tools with an EHR to actually move the needle on both care team productivity as well as the patient having access to their doc in a way that they expect to, which is not through a portal, but in fact, like a normal uh, consumer, like when you're buying something from Amazon, when you, um, you expect you know, on-demand service, do it yourself, and, and a lot of just easy to text, easy to consume information, videos, et cetera. So there's a lot of opportunities that have been very much accelerated. Um, I think it's yet to, to be seen what will happen post-pandemic and then post-post-pandemic. My hypothesis is it will be some sort of complement or hybrid. Uh, we won't completely go back to uh, how it was, but I don't think we're gonna completely go, go virtual either. So I think it's about being strategic and adaptive to whatever is going to happen, which remains uncertain. And Judy? Oh, she's on mute again. It shouldn't be that hard to remember to do that. <laughs> um, so a couple of thoughts. My first one is around nurses specifically. Um, and hopefully there's some nurses on, on the, the call listening in. You know, I think this has been an unprecedented time for nurses. Um, early on in the pandemic uh, specifically, you know, we got unbelievable social recognition as just most noble heroes, right? There was so much positive, um, you know, thank yous and, and press about what nurses were doing and, you know, how they were putting their own lives at risk and all those kinds of things. And I think it, it took nursing and sort of elevated it a bit so that people really understood better what we did. Um, and that's not going to change. Now, what has changed, unfortunately, is everybody's got this pandemic fatigue, right? So the idea that we're continuing to have conversations about that, not so much. Um, however, I think it's sort of locked in, in that, um, you know, we will always be that or continue to be that trusted um, professional. And I think um, that was something that was just, you know, um, 
un unexpected, at least for me, and, and showing the resilience of nurses, for example. Um, so I think when we start to talk about the changes that we need to make as we move toward value-based care and, and as we move toward um, patient empowerment, um, nurses are gonna be key in that transition. And I think to leverage the power that we've, we've got now to be able to help patients see how it's not about that clinic visit. It's not about the hospital stay. It's about how you live your life. It's about what you do with your life, how you eat and exercise and all the things that we all know. And people sort of academically know that, but don't necessarily put it into practice. Um, so that's my, my first, first part. Um, my second part, and I wanna act actually, if you don't mind, ask Leitchia and, and Gita to weigh in on this one. Um, you know, we've sort of forced some, um, activity onto the patient, right? So they have to initiate the virtual um, encounters now. Um, we've put more on them. And there's been a lot of um, press about the fact that we're falling behind in preventive care and we're falling. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, I think possibly, but yet lots of people are going out and getting flu shots and getting them early and taking the initiative to do it, you know? Um, and so I'm wondering what Laiji and Gita think about the longer term impact of the pandemic on patients and their own empowerment and their own participation. And of course, I think both of them have had this at a centerpiece of their of their work over the years, particularly Laiji. I know that's a lot of what you thought about when we worked together at ONC. So I'm, I'm happy to jump in, Judy. I think um, I imagine we'll get into politics a little bit later, but it's interesting. It sort of depends. There are different groups of patients who are clearly having lots of extremely different experiences right now. I think in some ways it's been really fabulous in terms of patient engagement and health that the pandemic has forced many people to do virtual visits, to think about health and healthcare differently. And maybe, again, depending on the tools that they use, so with, with a platform like Cariums, it's a really comprehensive look at your life. And it makes you think about things like the exercise you're getting and what you're eating and connects you to a coach. So you're not kind of on your own. Um, and I think that for people with that sort of a circumstance, certainly you have access to that kind of, uh, you know, kind of tool or um, kind of a relationship with their caregiver. This can really push forward patient engagement and health. On the other hand, though, honestly, the thing I'm seeing, and uh, I imagine Gita will want to weigh in on this too, there's a real difference politically in how people are thinking about how they handle the pandemic. And I never would have guessed that issues like, should I wear a mask or not, would become as highly politicized as they have. So something that worries me a lot in the big picture, and it's not just about the pandemic, is about a big spread of disinformation, misinformation, and um, like, I love the idea on the one hand of people being empowered and having ideas with regard to their health. And yet somehow along the way, we've gotten a lot of misguided information out there that can be harmful, not only to individuals, but to communities. And um, I'm concerned that that's gonna extend not just into kind of the, are you gonna wear a mask or not kind of questions, but also assuming we do get a vaccine, I think it's going to be a really challenging battle to get everybody to feel comfortable actually taking it or enough people. So it's a mixed bag in short. For some people, it's a great accelerant and it's terrific. And yet, unfortunately, this, this again, ties into the whole environment we're in right now. There's this kind of fracture. And some people are taking their health and other people's health into their own hands in ways that are not good by just disregarding all the kind of warnings and guidelines about, um, about COVID. And Gita? Sure. So, you know, I, I would say the same. It's, it's, I think that health and wellness are top of mind for everyone in a way that it never was before, right? People are walking more, they're jogging more, they're thinking about what they eat. They're trying to think of how do I not go to the emergency room or go uh, to the hospital? I, I do think to Judy and Lydia's point, there's like short-term prevention and there's long-term, right? So folks that maybe need a mammogram or pap smear are saying, gosh, can I wait? Can I wait till this is over? Can I wait till there's a vaccine? But the flu shot, I'm gonna get that because that's right now and it could keep me out of the hospital right now. So I'm excited to see that healthcare is the topic at the kitchen table period and people are, are wanting to stay well and, and keep their family well and, and their communities well. Um, 
I think that there is a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of misinformation. I think we don't have the data yet, frankly, to know how many people are actually not getting preventative services versus this is a snapshot of moment in time, right? We're very much driving the car as we're, as we're going here. But I, I do think health and wellness is, is top of mind in a way that we've been asking our patients to do for a long time. And again, I'm actively seeing patients through the epidemic. And I will tell you, the pandemic, I will tell you that through this, one of the things that I think is a good thing that has happened is there is some patient responsibility, right? I can't go home with you. Judy can't go home with you. You could have the best doc, the best nurse in, in, in your city, but you do have to take accountability for your lifestyle, for what you eat, um, for certain things in your life that you're, you know, your doctor can tell you have a, have a low sodium diet till they're blue in the face. But if you don't actually implement that, uh, your blood pressures will be high and you'll need medication. So I am excited to see that the patient responsibility piece is real. Um, I will say we have done a disservice to everyone by all of the miscommunication and misinformation that has been out there and the politicization of science um, will not serve any of us. And that's something that we just as a society will hopefully um, come back to and, and again, bolster our healthcare system in the end with, because I think we're realizing how fragile it is through all of this. Mm. And, and just to put a finer point on that, you know, I think over time, of course, we learned things about COVID. And, you know, I, I think it's hard for the average individual to understand that that's what happens in healthcare. We don't know everything, you know, and that we're constantly building our evidence and understanding better what works and what doesn't work. So when the masks started, of course, it was like, you don't have to wear one, right? And then that got confusing when all of a sudden we're supposed to be wearing them. And then, you know, it transfers on surfaces. No, not really. It really doesn't transfer on surfaces and surfaces. And so I think there was also, you know, what we consider sort of the natural progression of how things work in healthcare. Um, people had transparency into that and, and they didn't get it like, like we get it. They thought we kept changing our mind. Yes, definitely. Um, the whole progression of how things, of how what we even know about the disease changed too. So, um, Gita, it was appropriate we saw your daughter <laughs> as a working mom. How do you plant your day in all the additional roles that you have now? And do you have any advice for working mom during the pandemic? Oh, good Lord. You know, you can make a plan, it's never going to work out, whether it's life as a working mom or not, right? I think that's just life. Um, you know, I would just first say that it's hard. I, I, I think just acknowledging it is very hard. It, it was always hard. COVID made it harder because now we're like schooling from home. And after six o'clock, I put on my teacher hat and not just my mom hat like before. So it's, it's definitely challenging. Um, I would say it's also a relief, right? You know, having my daughter come in, right? Sometimes you get so serious in what you're doing and you remember that there's a family out there because so many of us are working like seven to seven now because we're all home. So what else would we do but work? So it's, it's refreshing to have young kids around us sometimes, right? Sometimes we don't want that. <laughs> um, but I, I think we do the best we can. I, th I think it's a time also for creativity. Um, you know, Halloween is around the corner. We've done our thinking on, you know, how do we not trick or treat, but still keep spirits up and make sure that we're not, you know, adding to the to virus numbers, right? So we're doing like a very small block party, glow in the dark basketball, glow in the dark soccer, glow in the dark hula hoop contest. I mean, we're, we're trying to have fun through this pandemic. It's very difficult. Um, I, I would just say that there are some days I'm a better mom, other days I'm a better doc, and other days I'm a better executive. And I think that those just keep rotating and, um, and I think our kids are actually finding a lot of strength and resiliency. And the more you talk and share with your kids, I find that at least with my daughter that I say, you know what, I'm sorry, I snapped at you. There's a lot going on at work and I just, I snapped, right? And I shouldn't have done that. And there's a lot of like, it's okay, mommy. I get cranky sometimes too. So I, I think treating your kids like people who are also uh, going through this crisis with us is incredibly, um, there's a lot of strength in that. And I think that this generation in particular is gonna look back at this time and remember how we also as parents dealt with it and how they deal with a crisis tomorrow that was very much very much unplanned. Mm -hmm. Are you very real with your daughter about what's going on or do you kind of like flower it and make it look pretty or like how, how do you communicate with your daughter about everything? Sure, you know, I'm, I'm pretty real with her. I mean, I think I'm pretty real with her in general, um, but she's also an age where she can kind of understand stuff. And again, 
they're like, Haller is not really real. We're not talking about mRNA and DNA tests, right? Mm -hmm. We're just saying, I don't have the answer. This is a new right. thing. It's just a new thing that nobody ever expected. And, you know, I, you're not going back to school because mommy and daddy are worried that something could happen to you. And the best thing we can do is keep you at home right now. So, but we are definitely being really um, honest with kids. I, I think that's the way to lower their anxiety. And I'm certainly reading all kinds of like parenting through the pandemic sort of literature. Um, but I, I do think that this is about doing the best we can during a pandemic or not. And I think as women in general, we tend to be the giving tree. We tend to be martyrs. And I think that the, the number one thing we have to do through this pandemic is when you need that oxygen mask and you need your alone time or you need time for self-care, it's important that you take it because everyone that depends on you around you is going to be infected if you don't, right? So you not exercising, not eating, not resting is actually a disservice to everyone that you support. And you'd be surprised when you ask for it that everyone's willing to support uh, support you. I think just as women, we always feel like, no, you know, it's it's, it's my role and it's my job. But um, Judy's much further along. I think Judy now has grandkids, if I remember. <laughs> so I'm hoping being a grandparent is a lot more fun. We talk about that too. I always tell Sonia, I'm gonna take my grandkids to space. And she's like, you can't take them to space without my permission. I'm like, of course I can. And we have this whole dialogue about going into space when I'm a grandparent, Judy, you might miss out on that. but. I'm totally going to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fun, but I would say that I wouldn't trade it for anything. I feel so excited to do everything I do. And, and it's nice to have my daughter in the other room. So, yeah, it's nice. So the next questions for oh, Judy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on, on this idea of, um, you know, and, and women typically are this way anyway, we tend to talk more than not, you know, whereas the the man might keep it to himself and not talk. We tend just in general to talk, but I wanna bring up this idea of transparency, no matter who your kids are. My kids are 35 and 38. So yeah, a little different than, than Gita's. Um, and yes, I'm a grandmother uh, two times over. And, but what's, what's interesting about it is to have the conversation. And I think in these, these troubling times, whether it's talking about getting a new job or leaving a job or whether to, well, I was telling these guys when we were preparing for this, going to a wedding, you know, my nephew was getting married, um, thinking about the holidays, thinking about what we're gonna do at Thanksgiving and what we're gonna do at Christmas. You know, my, my oldest is a vice principal at a high school in Colorado and they're doing in person classes. Um, and, you know, am I comfortable with her coming here and, you know, coming into our bubble? Um, my daughter with the grandchildren is a nurse and she's here in our bubble, you know. And so you just have to talk it through. And it's not about what's allowed and what's not allowed. You know, that's not, I, I guess, in some ways that's easy. You know, what the restaurants are open, they're closed, you know, kind of thing. But it's more about what you're comfortable with and what you're personal risk is and the risk of the the people that you're around so just reminding everybody to have the conversation you know whether it's work colleagues or family colleagues you know and everybody's struggling with this everybody yeah can i jump in on the kid thing too yes so I, I have a tween and a teen an 11 year old and a 15 year old both girls um, it's a stressful time because I think those ages, like life is stressful anyway, but I can tell you with regard to kind of frank conversations, it's not just about COVID, but, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, you know, uh, abortion, all kinds of things that are part of the news, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg dying, like I'm in the middle of Washington DC and you cannot avoid politics at all. And I feel like there are so many issues that um, have come to the fore recently that, I mean, we just, I try to convey as much as I can, as clearly as I can, except maybe to minimize my own stress sometimes, yet I admit it, but I want to sort of take and support some of theirs. That, and I find I take on role of almost like cruise director, where I'm like, every Sunday, we're going to get out as a group and we're going to go bike ride or something. Like, I feel like for my own health, but also for the mental and physical health of the whole family, that I want to make sure that everyone's particularly like getting outside and getting physical, you know, fresh air and exposure to distance to other people and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a mix, it's tough, but you also have to celebrate in some ways, I gotta admit, I'm sort of happy to have my 15 year old trapped here. She'd be horrified if she overheard me, but like I get to actually see her like at lunch every day, how cool. Very nice. 
Uh, actually, Laiji, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, if a woman is voluntarily taking a break now to be with the family or take on the additional roles that she has, or if she's staying in her role, um, how can she reinvent herself? How can she keep herself marketable so she can go back into the market when, when she's ready? Yeah, good question. Um, of course, none of us knows when normal is. <laughs> Yeah. But I think that the best way to think about it is to keep learning and kind of spend that. I know that it's hard because a lot of us don't have a lot of free time, particularly if we are juggling work, households, family, all kinds of stuff. But keep learning, like listen to webinars, like join things like this. Find out the other thing that I would do is take a lot of advantage of social media, scroll around without getting too sucked into like political debates, like follow topics that you're interested in, follow people that you're interested in and see what they say about things that you like, maybe start interacting with them. And that way you're kind of future proofing yourself, whether it's at your maybe current company that you're with or just later on down the line. I think um, many of us have found it's amazing over the course of a decade or two, how people will swing back into your life again and again in awesome ways. Example, Judy. There she is. Judy was actually my boss for like a couple of years. So awesome. We Thanks. should all be lucky enough to have employees like you. That's all I have to say. <laughs> um, so Judy, I have a question for you. What advice do you have for someone who finds herself in a career transition changing right now? Um, is this different than what you would give in to someone that was transitioning a year ago? So that's also interesting. Um, you know, we transition for different reasons, right? Sometimes we transition because we're forced to. Sometimes we transition because we choose to. Um, I know, you know, both times that I did it, it was I, I chose to do it and I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. And um, by way of setting this up again, you know, sometimes it's for our own growth and it's something that we know is going to be satisfying to us. And other times it's something where we know we can really make a difference and we choose to make the change because we know that we have something to offer. And of course, when you have something to offer, that's still self-serving. I mean, it still makes you feel good too. Um, but I know when I went to the government, you know, I took a 50% cut in pay and, uh, <laughs> you know, it was one of those things. It wasn't about the money, right? It was about the work and my ability to contribute in a way that I was, was hoping was really going to be, be meaningful. Um, so I've been helping actually a couple of people um, over the last month um, do career transitions. And first of all, the jobs are out there. I mean, I'm, I'm actually shocked at, the opportunities that people are surfacing and, and applying for. Uh, I'm shocked um, because companies have realized this is going on for a while. We don't yet see the light at the end of the tunnel. And because of that, they're just moving on with their hiring. They're not saying I'm going to wait or this or that. And um, so it's all done, of course, virtually. Uh, your interviewing is done virtually. So that's going to be your biggest difference is to let folks see your real personality on a, in a virtual way. So it's no longer going to be about what's on that piece. I mean, it's about what's on the piece of paper and your background and, you know, your CV and your, your um, curriculum vitae and all that kind of stuff. But um, when you do get that interview, you're going to be needing to make sure you can be comfortable in the medium because you want to show your personality. You don't want it to just be, you know, reiterating what's on that piece of paper. Now, interestingly, the two people that I'm, I'm helping um, right now that, um, well, one of them already got the job and the other one is in the finals. Both of them were asked to do a presentations. Um, they were given a case study and these are two different companies, but they were given case studies and asked to do a presentation about the case study. Um, and so I think that's maybe companies ways of thinking about how they can get to know a person better when they can't actually meet the individual in person. Um, and so I thought that was interesting. Um, and certainly if you're asked to do that because you're making a, a transition or a job change, um, you know, take your time to, to really think about it. Um, 
I think it's it's scarier now. That's the other thing I'd say. You know, um, I come from an era again, older, um, that you know you didn't quit one job until you had the next job. You know, and I don't see that at all. You know, going on with the twenty somethings and the thirty somethings and even the forty somethings. You know, they're they're looking ahead and saying, I want to make a change. You know, I'm going to put the baggage behind me and then I'm going to start interviewing. And so they quit before they even have the next job. And um, again, because the jobs are out there, especially in our industry, this health IT industry, um, you know, I'd say go for it if you're, you're feeling comfortable and you can afford those few weeks or months that you're going to have to be off um, for applying for jobs. Like Gia, do you have anything to add? I think that's good advice. I would also add that just as healthcare has become more virtual now, it's more common to see a doctor wherever virtually. I think more companies, or I should say organizations, are open to hiring people at a distance. So that's an opportunity and you're no longer as limited by your geographic location. Um, people are more comfortable with you, know, you being wherever because they've gotten plunged into that world. So take advantage of that. That mm -hmm. opens up new doors. How do you feel the culture when you're interviewing virtually and doing everything virtually? If that's that something that's harder. important to you. Yeah, no, that is a little harder. And um, it's interesting. So Carium um, is about 50-50 people who in non-COVID times were on site versus virtual. So we were actually built on purpose to be open to kind of a virtual family. And I was a little bit nervous about it because I'm one of the virtual people. And I thought, am I gonna miss everything? Cause everyone's gonna be hanging out at the water cooler and I'm not and whatever. But it was kind of really built in intentionally to the culture. And I would say that's probably not the case with many organizations. So you have to sort of, I think you have to ask. Like they were blatantly clear about how they'd constructed it to make it work for people in different places. And this was something that they emphasized a lot. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is no right fit culture for everybody. So there's no, you know, one answer, but I will just say, as I go on in my career, I feel more and more who I work with matters a lot. <laughs> I mean, when I was earlier on, I thought it was kind of all about what I was working on. But increasingly over time, I'm like, yeah, of course, I want to make a difference and I need to be engaged in what I'm doing. I need to apply skills that fit. But really, if I'm working with people I admire and like, it's all good. As far as people who are really difficult, life is just too short. Yeah. And Gita, have, do you have anything to add? Oh, Judy, go ahead. I just have to jump on that last and it's short. You know, I've always said this, honest to God, I believe this my whole life, EQ versus IQ, you know, and, and you brought that up. It's about the people. It's about the people skills. It's not about what you know, it's how you apply what you know. And um, so that's, I guess, another thought as you think about a transition, yeah. You know, I agree with both uh, Lightia and Judy and, and totally agree with that, you know, especially in medicine, I'll tell you, egos are, are never um, in scarcity. Right. So you can be the smartest person in the room, but if you can't work with anyone in the room, your your value just, you know, down the tank. Right. So number one, you've got to be able to work with people. But but I think the advice that this audience needs is to advocate for yourself. Right. Women need to help women. Men need to help women. I have had the best mentors in my life. They are both men. Um, and women. I always offer as well to pay it forward. And I, I think we have to ask for the help, we have to take the responsibility of paying it forward, right? And, and not to be modest. This is a world that is in need of very smart um, healthcare people. The healthcare system in the United States is broken, right? And the constituent, the major constituent in every household of healthcare is women like all of us here on this um, event, right? And for the men listening in, you are advocates, you are our mentors, mentees, um, it is really time to ask for what you want. And because of this pandemic, working from home, work-life balance with kids, it's okay to say that you want to work from home. That is now acceptable. It is okay to say that you will work, but the, during these times you will have to go and drop and pick your kids or whatever your, your life situation might be. Um, I will tell you that in my current role, I onboarded virtually. I have continued to work with a team that I've never met, but because of the nature of where we're at, 
people are a lot more honest and you can actually pick up on the culture. You can actually pick up on dynamics and you should rely on this circle. You should re rely on your local chapter of HIMSS and or not official chapters of, of any organization to just reach out and try to get a pulse on things. But I think the number one thing I would convey to this audience is ask for what you want from a schedule work-life balance uh, perspective. Ask for the salary that is commiserate and competitive with your qualifications. And if you need help and or you need someone who's further along or, or, or has just been down that journey, this is a forum where we should be helping each other and asking for that. None of us got anywhere alone. None of us will get anywhere um, alone. I think we've learned that in this pandemic. So my number one takeaway would be do not be shy. It has nothing to do with the pandemic. It has nothing to do with transitions and care. The number one, one of the number one um, casualties of this pandemic are working women. And that is very important unfortunate and do not misunderstand what I'm saying but but economic power is power if you do not have a job if you do not you know add to the economic power in your household there are certain dynamics that get created and it's also whatever it is that you want for your children and the example that you set is always going to be at the forefront as opposed to what you say so I would just be very thoughtful about taking the time off and or just asking for what would work for you in this current situation. You will be surprised what employers are willing to do at this time for talent of which this group um, should think of themselves as and not just discount um, your own talent because it, we continue to be in an industry and in a slice of the industry where people who have uh, those skills are very valued and employers are afraid. I, I'll tell you today, we had several people interviewed for a role from a top health tech firm that is insisting that people live in their geography. There's like a mass exodus happening. And one of the number one asks is we just wanna be able to live anywhere now. It's just no longer the greatest company in the world if I have to move to that location. So you would be surprised what you can get, half-time, part-time, full-time, Tuesday, Thursday schedules, ask for it. Let them say no, don't say no before, before uh, you can give anyone a chance to say no to you. That's great advice. Um, so this is a question for like Gia and, and others can also um, add. The times are now unique. There's no end duration. We started with two weeks and a month and now there's no definite end date. What advice do you have for surviving with all of these changes, not knowing the end date? That's a good one. So um, this is advice that I practice in addition to preaching. One is take care of your physical health. It sounds so basic, but try and maximize your sleep, eat decently, that kind of thing. Mental health, also important. Part of what that means is avoid, you know, getting online really late at night and reading stuff that stresses you out. Just don't do it. Make time to connect with friends or family members, whether it's by phone or Zoom, or maybe in some cases masked and out for a walk. Like that's fabulous. Um, but the other thing I think is to, given that we, we don't really know as you said, sort of what's ahead, how long the duration of all this is, set short manageable goals. Think about this is what I'm going to do for the next two months. I think I'm going to, you know, stick with this, you know, workout routine or whatever it is. Don't plan something. You're not going to like get ready to hike Everest, metaphorically speaking. Do something that's manageable, check in, and then reset. Manageable, check, and reset. So try and keep it manageable and doable. And, um, you know, don't be shy about just kind of celebrating your own success in even asking the question, how can I take good care of myself at this time? That's great. Gita, Judy, do you have anything to add? I do. I, I love Lydia's answers. I, I think um, this is clearly a marathon, not a sprint, right? Um, pace yourself, be gentle with yourself. And, and the way that, that I sort of talk about it with patients is take it a snack at a time. <clears throat> It seems more manageable to say, let's talk about November. Let's talk about the things we can do in November, the things we can eat in November, the, the things we can do in November. And then we'll worry about December later, right? We'll worry about planning spring of 2021 and whether there'll be a spring break or not later, because it's it's very overwhelming if we think about, you know, life before the pandemic, which seems um, seems so far away. Um, I would also say that have like a group of, of folks to Lydia's point, and, and again, everyone is so empathetic right now that you can just text, I think almost anyone in your circle right now is going, I have like a really bad day. Like I feel overwhelmed. You will be surprised how many people will support you because that same person that you outreach to, you're going to need them two weeks from now, 
right? I had a, a mom text me today that like, I'm so done with, you know, and it's just, it's amazing how we can all support each other and, and mental health is health, right? So if you are not mentally feeling healthy, you are not feeling healthy. And so I think to Idea's point, you know, take it one, one beat at a time. Um, I'm also a, a big advocate of, listen, vitamin C right now never hurt anyone, right? So whether it's a smoothie, a fruit a day, whatever you didn't do before this pandemic, definitely take care of yourself physically and mentally. Um, but I think there's some measured risks we have to think through for the holidays. And it's very important to keep your spirits up and your family spirit up. And it's time to get creative. It's, it's time to be very safe, but it's also time to get very creative about um, the way you're celebrating the holidays so that a connection can be felt. You know, maybe it's writing the grandparents um, a beautiful letter. Maybe it's um, doing a, a virtual Zoom with baking cookies. You know, there are, there are any number of ways that we need to all get creative, but convey that emotion and that connection. Um, and, and two ideas, you know, flip side, we're, we're all working so much and we're all so digitally connected that there are times when you do need to just say no devices, no TV, no worrying about uh, politics for, for, you know, 72 hours or whatever it is that you need. Um, but it's definitely not time to run a marathon um, or start cleaning the whole house, right? Take it easy, be gentle. Um, none of us is going anywhere anytime soon. So just take it one snack at a time is, is how we talk about it a lot at home. That's great. Judy? Yeah, you know, boy, you guys, you guys hit it all right on the head. So I have very little to say other than um, we all want it to be different. And so we keep thinking about the fact that the stuff is getting, it's taken away from us, you know? Um, we want to have our Christmas and we can't have our Christmas is getting taken away from us. And to turn it around like Gita was talking about, and instead of thinking it about what you can't do, think about what you can do and how you can make it meaningful um, in the best way that you can. And just say it's the one Christmas out of your life. You know, it's not 20 Christmases, it's one. And um, so keeping for perspective. Great. So I'm going to start with some questions from the audience. Um, we got a question about the vaccine. Um, are we going to have a vaccine sometime in the near future? Um, it may well be two doses that come from a single pharma company. We don't have a universal identifier. How do we ensure that the patients get the vaccine safely? There's something that the digital world can help with. So um, anybody can answer, either one of you can answer this question. You know, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't think any of us have the answer, right? Um, the reality of, 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 this is the best answer I think I can give you is first of all, the vaccine available to you today that will make a difference is the flu vaccine. Get the flu vaccine, unless you're allergic to eggs of which there are alternatives, but we should be doing everything we can to stay healthy in this moment. And like I said, snackables for today, there is no COVID-19 vaccine. Get the vaccines that you can get. This is how we've eradicated diseases in the past, right? When and if and how is still yet to be determined. There is absolutely a role for, for digital to play, but there's absolutely a role for us and, and human behavior to play, which is that no matter what the vaccine looks like, it will not be a silver bullet. It will take time for distribution. It will take time for clinical trial enrollment. It will take us time to learn as we go, just as we have all this time. The reality is that we don't need a vaccine. All you have to do is wear a mask and wash your hands and socially distance. So don't wait for the vaccine to start living. Just start to live in the context of where we are now. And I promise you, we are all and everyone is very much focused on the vaccine. When it's here, we will be going so fast to get it distributed and manufactured that that won't be an issue. But I, I think we have to realize that this is a marathon and you need to do everything you can at this moment of time to prepare you for then. So I will now turn it to Lydia and, and Judy. I hope that wasn't too soapboxy. <laughs> well, the only other thing I'll say is there are state-based vaccine databases and um, that do keep track of not just the, the kids' vaccines, but our flu vaccines. So there is a pretty decent knowledge base about you know, what vaccines different folks have had. And it has had some reasonable interoperability with the electronic health records in most states for a long time. I mean, like 10 years, kind of long time. Um, and so I think there's a, a decent way to think that um, 
the distribution and the uh, receiving of the vaccines will be able to be adequately um, documented, not just in the EHR, but in the, the vaccine uh, database. Great, Lygia, you have anything to add? I have no deep knowledge. I wish I did additional <laughs> knowledge. That's great points. <laughs> okay, great. So moving on politically, um, we have several changes coming up, possible changes. Um, where do you see health IT going or being affected or influenced in the current political environment, locally, Senate, House, President, everything? So um, Gita, why don't we start with you? Sure. I mean, I think if there's anything the pandemic has exposed is again the fragility of the healthcare system, right? And if there's anyone, if there's anything we've realized, it's truly the value of our frontline workers, doctors, nurses, every member of the care team. So I think what we've realized so far is that digital technology, specifically telemedicine and virtual medicine, is helping us improve capacity across the, across the board and improve access. I don't see this going away independent of election results. Digital technology is a big part of our success um, through this, a big contributor for the successes anyway that we have had. Um, there was a JAMA article in I think June of this year that actually talks about uh, the current crisis and, and how lucky we are not to be in 1918 because we do have digital tools and technologies and ability to have forms such as this because of technology and if we didn't, we would be suffering a very similar state to 1918. So I, I do think this is the time to double down on technology. And I don't think, um, I don't think any data points, points differently, frankly. Yeah, so I would add, um, I think even before COVID-19, if you looked at health IT, it was a relatively apolitical topic in that everybody thought it was a mostly good idea. And I would say that politicians or career folks across the sort of ideological span were pretty much promoting and supportive of an increase of IT. So that's a stabilizing factor and that's a positive certainly. And you add on to that, of course, the impact that COVID-19 has had, which has made IT look and indeed in reality be that much more important. However, I think the broader context really does matter which is that you know there are challenges, there's a challenge to the ACA that the Supreme Court is gonna vote on in the near term. Um, there are a whole raft of other issues like how we manage COVID that are really burning issues so much so that I think it's, for me, it's almost hard to think about health IT specifically without really sorting out how we're gonna wade our way through these larger contextual forces and sort of directions in where we're gonna go as a country. So I think um, getting clarification on the election will be important, but also um, it's not just the presidential, you know, who, who wins, um, but also the Senate, you know, waiting to see what kind of a balance we have in Washington, because that could really make a big difference, I think on a lot of issues, particularly related to access to care, who pays for what, and there will be a lot of new costs and challenges, I think, um, many of them related to the pandemic and kind of ongoing coverage of whether it's a vaccine and its distribution or care for folks. Um, there's certainly, I think this is an evolving area of understanding, but what does it mean to be a COVID survivor? Can you get COVID on multiple occasions? What might be some long-term impacts to health? And we're going to have to figure out as a country how we kind of manage those. Thanks. Judy? Yeah, um, <laughs> I wish I could say that the presidential election doesn't have anything to do with health IT, and it kind of doesn't. I, I agree with Lygia on, on that point, but there's so many other emotional factors about it that, you know, who can think about anything else right now? Um, but her last point where, you know, the um, ACA and whether that holds and what parts of that hold and whether... Um, you know, the Medicare for all is kind of off the table because, you know, Biden has been very, very clear that he's not 
for that, but some other alternatives from a government standpoint that might be more like what we saw in the exchange kind of standpoint um, for the purchasing of insurance if you don't have private insurance um, might be an interesting um, way to support um, people who are underinsured or uninsured right now. Um, but otherwise, I think the momentum right now is around, well, not quite momentum, that's too strong of a word, but 21st Century Cures, of course, had set us up for all the, the good interoperability stuff. And yet again, today, they delayed the, the first component of that for information blocking because of the pandemic. So um, everything that was supposed to get implemented related to interoperability has now been pushed, pushed back at least six months. That being the case, no one's ever talked about removing it completely. I mean, um, not only the law is still there, but the, the rulemaking has, has continued and have, has been approved. It's just the dates that have changed. So for me, that's the biggest change I think we're going to see going forward. Um, and that's going to stick, I think, no matter what party um, stays in power, whether it's the Senate or the, the president, um, that we are going to be breaking down the walls and getting better opportunity to share information that's patient centric as compared to you know being facility centric or or siloed around an electronic health record great um one last question um how soon do you think we will see approval from cms on digital therapeutics either one of you can answer There's a lot going on. I don't see that happening anytime soon. <laughs> That's gonna be my answer on that one. They're kind of busy right now. <laughs> but but Judy and, and Light do you know more than me? Well, I was kind of gonna go the same place. I boy, yeah, I am I, I don't see that getting a lot of play right now. Mm -hmm. uh, too many other things going on. I would probably agree and add that this is probably something that involves. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's an FDA role, there's a CMS role, there's a lot of different pieces and there are so many other issues that are kind of on fire, I guess, that I think this would be slightly like, don't hold your breath, I guess, probably. Okay. Um, any last words before we go? Hang in there. We can do this. I know this is totally discouraging and it's frustrating, but it's like, it's really heartening, I think, to connect with other real humans who are all trying to make a difference within the same field and um, who have, you know, a passion for supporting one another, which is why we're all here. Just stick with it, ladies and gentlemen who may be out there. We will make it through this. Yeah, same thing. You know, it's it's we're in this together, and um, make sure you continue to talk. Talk to people like us. Talk to each other. Reach out to your friends. Talk to your family. You know, um, don't don't hold anything inside because everybody is in a similar place. Yeah. Do not be shy. Do not be shy. We're we we really are all in this together, and. Career questions, life questions. This is hard for men. This is hard for women. Um, we're going to come out of this better. We're going to come out of this so much better and, and, and actually so much more connected. So just don't, don't discount yourself. Ask for what you want. Um, starting first with this community and then wherever you choose to take your, your life and your family. Great. Thank you all for, thank, thank you the three of you for joining us today. Um, we learned a lot from you and thank you all for joining us, all the guests that are here. I'm going to leave you with a message from Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, do the thing you think you cannot do. So on that, um, thanks again. And if you'd like to join a breakout room, um, we'll be doing that in a couple minutes. But thank you all for coming. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.